Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, I have the pleasure of being joined by the phenomenal nightmarish tales on this dark night. Be warned though, story three touches on sexual themes, and if it's something that you would rather skip, you can find the timestamps in the description. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. My wife lost her battle against breast cancer last month, leaving me alone to take care of our daughter Ellie. Every single night, Ellie asks if mum is going to tuck her in, and every night, I have to beg her before she'll let me do it instead. How can I even begin to explain to a four-year-old that she'll never see her mummy again? I don't even know how to explain it to myself. If I died instead, I'm sure my wife would have known the right things to say. Death wasn't a mystery to her like it was to me. She told me that a person's life force never really goes away. It only changes form. I hated hearing her talk about her death so casually, but she was always so soft and patient that even in her final hours, it felt like she was the one who had to protect and comfort me. You'll understand when I'm gone, she told me, leaning on my chest, where we both crowded on the narrow hospital cot. Some flowers only grow from corpses, and when you see them, you know I'm still with you. She died that night, and no matter how many times I repeated her words, I couldn't feel her anymore. I told Ellie that mum was a flower now, and she asked me, which one? All of them, I said. She's every beautiful thing in the whole world. Ellie couldn't understand why I was crying, but she held on to me until she fell asleep, almost like she was the one protecting me, just like her mother did. I thought the flowers were just a metaphor for the good which still remained in the world, until the hospital called me the next day. They started asking me questions about my wife's mental health at the end and I told them she was always the calmest, most peaceful person in a room. I guess I got kind of defensive about it and snapped at them, but they explained. We're just trying to figure out all the bumps on her body that we found during the autopsy. It looks like someone made a deliberate incision, struck a seed inside and sewed it back up hundreds of times. Some flowers only grow from corpses. She must have thought it was symbolic, but it was disgusting to me. Imagining her sitting alone in her hospital, stabbing herself over and over. I thought I was going to be sick. They asked me if the mortician should take them out, and I said yes. The funeral director gave me a small velvet bag with all the seeds afterwards. I would have just thrown the vile thing away if Ellie hadn't have stopped me. We can plant them, she squealed, although of course I couldn't tell her where they really came from. I wanted to throw them out, but then she added, if they grow up to be tall and beautiful, then maybe mum will come and see them. I let her keep the seeds, and helped her plant them in the backyard. It still grossed me out, but it gave Ellie a project to focus on to distract her from Mum's absence. Mum has turned into flowers now, I told Ellie. It's what happens to everyone, sooner or later. A pretty weak explanation, but it was the best I had, and my daughter accepted it as a fact of life. And what flowers? I'd never seen anything like them before. 
blue and purple ones like galaxies being born, and great red trumpets burning brighter than a living flame. They grew quick too, three inches with buds in the first week, and almost a foot tall with the first blossoms by the second. It's mum, she's almost back. I'd gotten used to those little shrieks lately. Someday I knew I'd find the right words, but until then, the flowers were hope. I just hadn't counted on how convincing a hope they'd be. That one already has her hair, and look over there, she's smiling. Hair and teeth had started to grow by the third week. I thought it was just stringy stems at first, but it didn't take long before my wife's bushy brown hair was cascading down one of the plants, like a lion's mane around the flower. The teeth were even stranger, tiny at first like a baby's, but growing every day until a complete set of dentures encircled another blossom. And it didn't stop there either. Fingers, starting with the bone, which sprouted a new layer of muscle each day. A heart, swelling like a ripening fruit and beating where it hung below the flower. Each plant was devoted to a specific body part, growing from a child's size to fully grown in a matter of days. I was absolutely horrified, but Ellie was ecstatic. First thing she did every morning was race to the garden to see how much bigger they were. And every night, she'd sit in the dark and talk to the plants as though they were her mum. I wanted to cut them all down, but even mentioning the idea made Ellie scream like I was plotting murder. I didn't know what to do, or who to tell, and honestly, part of me wanted to believe too. Something miraculous was happening, and I didn't think it was my place to stop it. Hope can be even more blinding than despair though and I didn't see my mistake until last night. I'd just gotten up to use the bathroom when I passed by Ellie's room and found the door open. Ellie wasn't inside, but something else was. A long vine stretching from the garden, wrapped around her empty bed. The garden. I was wide awake in a second, tripping and scrambling over myself as I raced through the house. The front door was open too, bright red flowers twined around the handle, looking more the colour of blood in the ghostly half-light of the moon. Ellie's stuffed bear was discarded along the way, completely encompassed in thick vines which had grown long, vicious thorns overnight. The whole backyard was alive. The ground looked like a storm-tossed ocean, dirt teeming with masses of squirming unseen roots. The plants had all converged on one spot, where they formed a giant pulsing bud. Ellie, I screamed, charging towards the mass. Her hand caught me by the wrist before I'd taken two steps. A fully formed hand, my wife's hand, but she would never keep me from our daughter. I wrestled with the plant ripping the hand cleanly from where it sprouted. The roots were trying to entangle my legs, but I managed to kick loose before they had a solid hold. The shovel, I leapt back towards the house and the plants seemed to be momentarily forgetting about me as they reconverged on the twitching bud. A moment later, and I was charging back in, hacking and slashing with the metal blade, severing root and stem crushing fingers and splitting arms straight into the marrow. Whatever it took to get to my daughter. I was soaked in blood by the time I reached her. Some of my own from the jagged thorns, but most bleeding freely from the wake of mutilation I left behind. Ellie didn't look like she was in pain. She was laying perfectly still, eyes closed as though asleep, entwined in hundreds of thorns, 
which punctured her little body from all sides. As peaceful as my wife had been when she'd gone. But Ellie wasn't gone too. She couldn't be. I severed the vines with my shovel until I could pull her three, carrying her in my arms as I fled the garden. Her warm, draining blood drenched me as I went. These flowers needed a corpse to grow, and after they were deprived of my wife's body, they found their own instead. My daughter wasn't breathing. Her heart had stopped. In each of the hundred wounds which covered her body, a tiny seed had been carefully planted to fill the hole. The whole garden was dead by morning, shriveling without its corpse, like a drought-stricken field. Ellie died that night too, but I know she isn't gone. It seems like death is the end, but I understand now that it's just a transformation. I've planted her and the seeds in the garden, so they will have a body to grow from this time. And if I'm kind to death, if I nurture it as though it were my child, then I know someday soon, new life will sprout again. I found the first floater when I was seven years old. It had washed up on the shore about a hundred yards from my family's summer house. It still looked mostly human, a bit swollen and decomposed, but whole enough for me to immediately recognize what it was. Even as a kid, I was never very squeamish. I used to watch my father skin the dairy caught on his hunting trips. I would even clean my own fish whenever I reeled one in from the salty lake. Finding a human body was the best thing that could have happened to me that summer. I thought about telling my parents, but there's no way they would let me play with it. Heck, they might even ban me from going down to the water at all. A thought which my seven-year-old brain equated to nuclear holocaust, an asteroid destroying the earth, or other disasters of similar magnitude. So I did what any clear-thinking seven-year-old would do. I gathered up all the other kids I knew and charged them five dollars each to poke it with a stick. The salt water preserved it well enough for us to stomach the smell, but poking it would release some of the bloated gas still trapped in the carcass. I told them that they could get their money back if they could lick it without throwing up. No one got their money back. I made sixty dollars before one of the little snitches told his mother and she called the police. Next summer when I came back, the first thing I did was race back to the same spot. Sure enough, there had been two more bodies to wash up over the winter. These must have been sitting out in the sun for a while though, because I couldn't even get close to them. My father had followed me that time, and I wasn't allowed to have any fun. The police said the bodies must be new, since they would have been completely rotten if they had been down there for a year. Over the next ten years, there had been another three bodies found beside the lake. Each was slightly more decomposed than the last, but the police still insisted that they had to be separate incidents because they were all still too fresh. None of them could be identified, as they didn't fit any missing persons within the entire state, the police had no leads to discover who was dumping the bodies. They had given up, but I was never able to put the mystery out of my mind. I had my own theory. I decided that those people didn't just die in the lake, they lived in it too. I thought that when they die, they float to the surface just like when humans die they're buried in the ground. In retrospect, the idea didn't really make sense, but it had started forming when I was so young that I refused to let it go until the mystery had been resolved. When I was in college, I became scuba certified for the sole purpose of finding where those bodies were coming from. I rented my own equipment and went back to that lake the summer of my freshman year. The water was incredibly buoyant from all the salt, and it took almost 20 pounds of weight before I could finally sink to the floor. It was slow progress, working my way through the lake, and six separate dives before I found what I didn't even know I was looking for. A sunken plane. I don't know how long it had been down there, but it looked rusted as shit. One of the doors had completely rusted off, and I was able to enter and look around. 
There were two more bodies inside, no more than skeletons now. The inside of the plane was compartmentalized, almost like it was broken into sealed jail cells. The locks on some of the cells had long since rusted open, and I'm guessing these are where the floaters came from. If they were in their own pressurized air chambers, then that would explain how they were preserved for so long. As the plane deteriorated, they must have broken free and floated to the surface one by one. My most important discovery was the black box, although it was painted bright orange, so it's a pretty stupid name. I brought it back with me and swam to the surface to research my findings. The plane was a Douglas C-47, which was used for military transport during World War II. They were still being used for decades afterward though, some remained operational even up to 2012, so I still don't know how long it's been there. The flight data recorder had completely deteriorated but the cockpit voice recorder still had some salvageable tape. Most of it was fuzzy or jumpy but here's what I have. 164, roger. Unable to make out your last message. Please repeat. It's out. Repeat. One of them has gotten out. Has the cockpit been compromised? Negative. Cell block is... Please repeat, Captain. Repeat. Cell block is compromised. It's letting the others out. Fucking Christ. Remain calm, Captain. Can you neutralize the test subject? Not without compromising the cockpit. How far am I from the landing field? What the fuck is that supposed to mean? Not granted permission to land. Well then what the fuck am I supposed to do? Mission terminated. Thank you for your service, Captain. My service ain't over until I bring this bird down. You're ordered to force collision. Test subjects must not escape. Like hell I am. I'm bringing her down into some water now. Request rescue operations. Mission terminated. Rescue operation denied. After that, all I could hear was the engine sounds. It went on for about five minutes and I was about to stop listening when I heard something like a snarling tiger. I guess I haven't changed that much since I was a kid because I still don't want to bring this into the police. I've got another dive plan next week and I'm going to try to break open the remaining cell blocks to get a look inside. After reading all of your warnings, I'll admit I was pretty hesitant about making my second dive. Just to be safe, I decided not to go on this one alone. Two nights ago, I reconnected with Antoine, one of the boys who found some of the original floaters with me. He still remembered trying to lick the body to get his $5 back and we laughed about it. I guess that sort of thing only happens once in your life. I showed him the audio recordings I pulled from the black box and talked him into joining me. He didn't have dive equipment, but I knew I'd feel better with him in the boat. Notice feeling anything strange since you licked it? I asked him while we were rowing out to the middle of the lake. What kind of strange? You mean besides puking my guts out? Warts, new birthmarks in the shape of a pentagram, sudden urge to kill people, you know, something like that. Not that I can think of, he admitted. Except for my ability to talk to animals. <laughs> what? Seriously? Yeah. He smirked. They just don't talk back. Keep pulling your weight or the boat's gonna start turning in circles. Reading too many horror stories online must have made me paranoid. I don't know what I was so afraid of in the first place. The visibility was good underwater, and I didn't even see any fish, besides a host of little black water slugs scootering around. Instead of weights, this time I just used a crowbar to sink me down to the plane. The doors were so rusted they were starting to unfasten on their own so it was no problem breaking the lock off. I was tense, but I remembered to force myself to keep breathing evenly through the regulator. Holding my breath underwater could easily result in an arterial gas embolism. 
then I would be the next floater they found washed up on the beach. Even without the lock, the room was still pressure sealed with an air pocket inside. I tried leveraging the crowbar, but I still couldn't pry the door open against the weight of all that water. I managed to hammer on the door with the metal bar until a leak appeared. The wider I forced the hole, the more water flowed through to equalize the pressure. Once it was full, it should swing open without a problem. I finally worked the crowbar all the way through the door, but this time it got stuck. That's weird because the water was flowing freely around it, so there should be plenty of space to pull it back. It was almost as if something were holding it from the other side. That was a thought I could have done without. I freaked and dropped the crowbar, but without its weight I began to immediately float back towards the surface. I held onto the doorframe to keep myself from slipping upwards, but it was almost impossible to swim further down against my buoyancy. Luckily, I didn't have to. The cell finished flooding and the door began opening on its own. Suddenly, I was face to face with a dead body. Its skin had long since began to rot away, especially around its eyes and mouth where there were just gaping holes remaining. My crowbar had stuck straight into its side where it had gotten stuck. I was about to pull myself down towards it along the doorframe when I noticed the crowbar was sliding back out. No, not sliding. The body's hands were wrapped around the bar. They were pulling the crowbar out of its side. Had I jolted upward too quickly when I let go of the bar? Maybe I already suffered a stroke from the gas embolism without noticing. The body lurked towards me. Slow, even breaths. Don't stop breathing. Easier said than done with a dead body clambering up towards you. It was fast too, driven with a purpose. Legs and arms with openly rotten sinews moved effortlessly through the water like a practiced swimmer. I pushed my way out of the plane, but the body was right behind me. It dropped the crowbar and began ascending smoothly through the water towards me. It was just as fast, at least as fast as me even though I had fins. Shit, I kicked hard and without any weight I was raising way too swiftly. I couldn't stop myself. I felt the air expanding in my lungs so rapidly it felt like they would burst. I was practically screaming underwater trying to get as much air out as I could. Once I hit the surface, the scream finally became audible, although it was little more than a wheezing gasp at that point. Where was the boat? Antoine, get your ass over here! He was leaning over the boat and peering down into the water about 50 yards away. Fuck, I looked down and saw the shadow of the body swiftly ascending toward me. I swam hard towards the boat. Antoine wasn't reacting. There's no way he didn't hear me. Why the hell didn't he start rowing? He was just staring into the depth, his face about an inch from the water. Antoine, I swear to God, but my lungs felt like they were on fire. I couldn't take a full breath yet. All the air I had was going into keeping my legs kicking. The shadow was right underneath me now, ten feet from the boat. I ducked my head underwater and paddled as hard as I could. I was too slow, the body was intercepting me. About five feet away from the boat, it surfaced directly between me and the boat. But it wasn't an explosive surface, like something swimming upward. It just floated there, face down in the water, looking as dead as I felt. I had to push the body out of the way to get to the boat. I kept expecting a hand to grab my ankle and pull me back down, but there was nothing. I climbed into the boat and fell on my back, panting. My mask was cloudy, so I ripped it off. As soon as I could kneel again, I practically shoved Antoine straight into the water. What the hell is wrong with you? The push pressed him against the side of the boat. He tensed and relaxed, 
but didn't turn away from the water. It was like trying to wake someone from a deep sleep. He was just vacantly staring at the floating body now. The body was moving again though. Its ear was, anyway. Not a natural movement anymore. Not like the body was moving on its own. It was like there was something trying to crawl out of it. As I watched, one of the black slugs pushed its way out of its ear. It got stuck part way and had to gnaw its way through the rest of the cartilage with razor sharp teeth like a leech. It struggled out and the whole corpse shook like it was having a seizure. It looks like you had it wrong, Antoine said in a sleepy voice. Did he just wake up? There's no way he could have slept through that. His face was still down next to the water though and I couldn't get a clear look at him. What do you mean? The floaters we found weren't the test subjects, he replied, finally pulling away from the water. His body was shivering slightly and somewhere between freezing to death and full body ecstasy. The tail end of a black slug had just finished slipping into his ear. Of course they were. Why else would they be in the cells? I asked. By the time the words were out of my mouth, I had already realized it. The bodies were hosts to the test subjects. They had already been free in the water since all those years ago when the first floater broke free. How do killers and rapists choose their next victim? Does it have to do with some repressed childhood memory, fueling a blind hatred towards a particular kind of person? Or is it just something they see in the moment? The shape of a body, or her pretty face, stirring the blood into an undeniable throb. Whatever it is, I understand why he chose my co-worker, Casey. It's hard even looking at her without letting your mind wander. It's not that she's overtly sexual or provocative or anything. It's more the way she moves, graceful and flowing, to the point where even waiting tables looks like an intricately choreographed ballet. It was at the end of our shift the other day, when I noticed this customer staring at her. He'd been there for almost an hour, and he still hadn't ordered anything except a coffee. He didn't have a book, or a phone, or anything either. He was just fixated on her, tracking her every movement with his hungry eyes. Scruffy, coarse beard, leather jacket, snake tattoo winding all the way down his hands. I wouldn't want him staring at me. I tried to warn Casey and offered to drive her home as she lives right around the block but she didn't seem very concerned by him. She should have been though. The second she walked out those doors, the scruffy customer was on her heels, making zero effort to hide his single-minded fascination. I'm not one to be paranoid or anything, but there was a desperate urgency as he followed, a predator stalking the last few feet before the chase is on. Better safe than sorry, I hopped into my pickup and trailed them around the corner. Casey glanced over her shoulder, and she must have seen him, because she started walking faster. The man matched her stride for stride, almost breaking into a run the last few yards, before she reached the apartment. I parked on the street until I made sure she got in safely. The building needed a key to enter the lobby, and watching the man rattle on the locked door, it was obvious he didn't live there. I watched him pace restlessly for a minute, before he began to circle the structure. My instincts hadn't lied to me yet, 
He was still trying to find a way into the building. I got out of my car to watch what he was up to. I wasn't thinking about personal danger. All that mattered was that Casey was safe and that her thinking of me as a hero for looking out for her. I lost sight of the guy for a few minutes. After I turned the corner though, and I had to circle the whole building again before I realized what he was up to. He was climbing the metal exterior stairs of the fire escape. He must have jumped from the top of a dumpster to reach the platform. A black ski mask was pulled over his face. This was getting serious. I should have called the police at this point, but I was still entertaining this fantasy about charging in to save her, and my nerves were on fire with the thrill of the hunt. I clambered onto the dumpster and made a wild leap, action music playing in my head as I hauled myself onto the metal platform. I shouted at him to stop, but he was already four floors above me and disappearing into an open window. How much could he do to her in the time it took me to climb four stories. I didn't want to think about it. My last fight had been in grade school. What the hell was I thinking? It was becoming way too real, way too fast. But I'd already committed this far and couldn't turn back now. I raced up the rattling metal stairs with a sound like a herd of elephants. There was a scream. Casey scream but the air I inhaled had turned to daggers, as I was already going as fast as I could. Reaching the window he entered by, I dove inside, utterly out of breath and ill-prepared for whatever was awaiting me. I was in a bedroom. Casey was stripped to her underwear, face down on the bed, hands roughly tied behind her back. The man was looming over her. That's all I needed to know. I grabbed steel reading lamp from her desk and smashed it two-handed into the back of his skull. I wish he wasn't wearing the mask so that I could have seen the look on his face as he crumpled to the ground. Hey baby, what was that sound? She asked, muffled against the pillow. I was still trying to catch my breath and couldn't respond. It gave me a moment to take in the whole scene. The box of chocolates on the desk. The fuzzy pink ropes which tied Casey's hands. The fact that she wasn't struggling or trying to get away. How had he known this was her room from the outside anyway? Unless... The truth hit me so hard. I wanted to crumple on the ground next to her boyfriend. Or even better... Knock me out the window so she never saw me, or figured out what happened. Absolute panic, as she began turning her head in my direction. Mind, numbing, terrified, dry mouth panic, as I dropped to the ground under the bed. Well, I'm waiting, Casey said, wriggling her butt. I could only think of one solution. I ripped the ski mask off her boyfriend's unconscious body and put it on, and I stood up. Please don't hurt me, she wailed at an unexpected volume. Did she see through my disguise? I'm all alone, Mr. Intruder Man. What are you going to do? I couldn't answer or she'd recognize my voice. I couldn't run because she'd already seen me. And seeing her tied up in her underwear like that, practically begging for it. Well, if my mind wasn't already numb from panic, then that would have been enough to purge the rest of my thoughts. I was in absolute despair and euphoria at the same time as I climbed onto the top of her, feeling the curve of her body squirm against mine in a fantastic nightmare. And that's when I heard another deep moan. I knew it was her boyfriend on the ground, starting to wake up. There I am, frozen, now listening to her boyfriend waking up. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. I leap off 
and leaped straight down the window, completely naked from the waist down. A second later, there's the most ear-splitting scream, joined by a confused bellow. Casey appeared at the window a moment later, still naked, watching me fly down the steps and leaping onto the dumpster below, sliding off in my panic to plaster flat onto the ground. Thank God I was still wearing the ski mask. I hope she leaves her window open again tomorrow night. Imagine being lost in the open ocean, frantically bailing water out of a sinking raft which refills exactly as fast as you empty it. You will never be found, never be saved. Sooner or later you'll need to rest and seize your constant vigilance, but you're still fighting the waves for as long as you can. However hopeless, the terror of that dark water is more real than anything else in your dying world. That's what being a mother was like to me. I used to think the worst thing in life was not getting what you want. For me, that was starting a family. Something I obsessed over ever since I was a little girl, trying to make sure all my dolls successfully graduated and had families of their own. I fell for every boy that looked at me, always too fast and always the wrong one. Wasting so much time imagining weddings and baby showers and these elaborate, happy lives that were never lived outside of my head. Then all at once, in nursing school, I met a handsome neurologist and within six months, I was pregnant. I finally had what I'd always dreamed about, but the worst thing in life is not getting what you want. The worst thing is getting it, and then realizing how much happier you were before. My first son, Prater, was diagnosed with Spinal Muscular Atrophy, or SMA, an incurable genetic disease which left him barely able to move. Every day was an ordeal. Every hour, every minute. Constant paranoia that his feeble lungs would give up or he would choke on his own vomit and be too weak to struggle free. I had to drop out of nursing school, but my husband Jeffrey took good care of me leaving me to take care of the child. My husband switched focus with his work, moving into research designed to strengthen motor neurons and protect them from SMA. It was an impossible dream though. There were a range of potential treatments, but they were years away from even reaching human trials. I begged Jeffrey to sneak some experimental medication home anyway. But Prater was so weak that the injections would doubtlessly kill him long before the correct treatment and dosage was discerned. It wasn't my decision to have another child. I didn't think I could bear going through something like this again, but Jeffrey insisted. This can't be the end of your dream, he told me. This can't be the rest of your life. It wasn't until after I was pregnant again that he let his ulterior motive slip. It was the middle of the night, and I'd just gotten back in bed after checking on Prater. I don't think Jeffrey was even fully awake, but he nestled in so close to me and whispered, When the new kid is born, he'll be healthy enough to test the treatments on. We'll find something that works and everything will be okay. I didn't sleep for the rest of the night. I don't know whether it was fear or excitement. But I was so desperate that the two were beginning to taste the same. When my second healthy baby boy was born, I didn't give him a name. I just wrote X on his form. Jeffrey said it would be easier that way. By the time he'd exhausted the full litany of possible treatments, the new boy would likely be dead. I'd carried him for nine months, suffered for nine months. And for that sentence, I was able to give Prater a whole lifetime of health and happiness. Not a bad trade, not when you're so tired of bailing water from a sinking ship. Even so, I've never cried harder in my life than that first hour when I held him in the hospital. After that, I couldn't even look at the new baby. I pretended he didn't exist. Jeffrey took a sabbatical from work so he could continue his research from home. He waited until X was six months old before he began the experiment. And during that time, X lived in a makeshift nursery in the basement. 
I didn't see him, but I'd still hear the crying echo through the house sometimes. Jeffrey was diligent and made sure that the child's needs were met, and I occupied all of the time with looking after Prater, who was almost two by then. Science. It's not that eureka moment you see on TV. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. There was still so much that we didn't know about the disease, and even with ideal conditions and a proper experiment with control groups and A and B testing, it would have taken years. With a basement laboratory and a single experimental subject, and then later with Jeffrey having to return to work part-time, it took a decade before we began to see really promising results. All that time, I didn't see X once. Sometimes I was convinced that he died years ago, and that Jeffrey was just putting on a show of bringing food down to the basement to give me hope. All I saw was Prater, every day a little weaker. A continual mockery of what he should mean to have a childhood and a family. When at last we were ready to give the final drug to Prater, I wasn't prepared for the troubling question which accompanied that step. If Prater gets better and everything we ever wanted comes true, what are we gonna do with X? Jeffrey asked one morning at the breakfast table. It was unusually direct. Jeffrey would always allude to his experiments without directly mentioning the test subject. Even when it was unavoidable, he understood that I wasn't comfortable acknowledging the boy. I tried to change the subject, but he was insistent this time. We can't just let him out, you understand that, right? It's too late for him to lead a normal, functional life. And even if he could psychologically acclimate one day, the years of trials have- Do whatever you think is best. I cut him off. Are you telling me to- I'm not telling you anything. I just want you to do whatever is necessary. He nodded glumly, looking down at his coffee. The icy tension mounted as we listened to Prater crackling at his cartoons in the other room. He looks like me, Jeffrey said, not looking up from his coffee. It took me a second to realize he wasn't talking about Prater. Why would you even tell me that? He calls me dad, Jeffrey added. He was finally looking up, but I was the one who couldn't meet his gaze. You shouldn't have taught it to talk, was all I could say. That's even worse than giving it a name. The experiment was otherwise a success. Within a week of Prater's first injection, his voluntary movements were becoming smooth and controlled. By the end of the first month, he was able to walk on his own. Listening to his breathing became steady, seeing his radiant smile as he took his first steps, the squeals of his excitement when I drove him by the school he would enroll in next semester. It was sublime and almost surreal in its fantastic impossibility. When we got back home, Prater was so full of vitality that he even outpaced me from the car to the house. Entering first, he turned around to ask, Why is this door open? It's never open. I stopped cold on the doorstep. Is there anything... anyone else there? Nope. What's down there? A flight of empty steps going down. The lights were off. The room was empty. Mom, why is there a bedroom under the house? I closed the door to the basement. The padlock was gone. It's just a guest room. There's no one visiting though, so we don't use it. Do you know where dad is? Can I go see? I want to see the other room. Prater insisted. I was never any good at saying no to him. That must be why he looked so surprised when I shouted, Get out of here! Go find your dad right now! Jeffrey didn't come home that night. Calls went straight to his voicemail. Three options continued to surface in my mind. One, Jeffrey is bringing X to live somewhere else. Two, Jeffrey is taking X somewhere to kill him. Neither of those explained why he would leave the door open. Option three, X has escaped and something has happened to my husband. I strained to remember all the vague mentions of X that I'd intentionally blocked out at the time. Something had happened to him during the trials. Something besides the psychological effect, that's what Jeffrey had said. 
What exactly had he endured down there? The thought had crossed my mind countless times before, but it had been so repressed that I'd never taken the time to really think about it. What would life be like for someone like that? Alone, except for those few hours a day that Jeffrey spent experimenting on him. The chemicals he must have ingested. The lies he must have been fed to justify his pitiful existence. What would someone like that do if their world was ripped away overnight? I didn't let Prater leave my sight. I sat in a chair in his room, reading him stories until he fell asleep, and then just sitting there, watching him. Maybe I should have gone to a motel or something, but he was so worn down from his outings that day and the medication was still so new that I didn't want to push him. Instead, I just sat and waited. I didn't know what I was waiting for, but I'd know when I saw it. Or heard it, as it turned out. Mom? I must have fallen asleep in the chair sometime during the night. Yes, Prater? I mumble, not quite awake. No, not Prater. My eyes flew open. It was dark, but I could still make out the outline of Prater sleeping in his bed. Someone else, something else, was standing in my room. I couldn't see anything but the silhouette, but the shape was unrecognizable. Gnarled, bulbous, and utterly grotesque, cut into the night like the darkness itself had reared to life. All I could really see were the eyes. Great pools of white, without iris or cornea. Jeffrey? Jeffrey! I shouted. I couldn't even stand. Not with it so close peering down at me like some sort of specimen. Dad doesn't know I came back, X said. I wanted some time alone with you. Are you my mom? These words slurred into each other, but the hot whisper was so close I seemed to feel their meaning more than hear it. No, she's not. She's my mom. Prater was awake now too, sitting up and clutching his blankets to his chin. I managed to turn my phone's flashlight on, regretting it immediately. X's face was devastated with ruptured boils and deep pitted lines. His features sloped jaggedly towards the left, as though he'd suffered multiple strokes. His pale eyes twisting in agony at the sudden light. In his hand, he held a syringe, filled with a thick, black syrup. It wasn't Prater's medicine. Turn it off, turn it off, X shrieked blindly swiping the syringe through the air. I jumped out of the chair and toppled it, brandishing my light like a weapon. Prater, follow me, I shouted. My son began to clamber out of bed, but he was still too weak. He was shaking so badly that he fell straight onto the floor in a crumpled heap. The light burns, turn it off, Mom. Mom, that word was a dagger. I kept the light on X's face while I made my way around the edge of the room to where Prater fell. I fumbled the phone while trying to lift him off the ground. The light veered away from X's face. I could feel him charging towards me through the sudden dark, but I had Prater around my shoulders now. I was running, flinging myself down the familiar halls of my house with shadows that twisted into an alien nightmare. I could hear X limping and lurching behind me, pursuing me with incredible haste despite his disfigurement. The basement, it was the only safe place I could think of. I leapt headfirst toward the stairwell, grabbing the door and slamming it behind me. I put my back against the smooth metal, feeling it vibrate as X slammed into the door again and again from the other side. The force of the impact, it was like trying to stop a car. My bones were rattling against each other in harmony with the blows. Human tissue should pulverize under an impact like that. If X even was human anymore. Honey, are you in there? It was Jeffrey, somewhere above. Help us, we're in the basement, X is trying to kill us. Shouting. Running, a high-pitched scream so pitiful and desperate that it still felt like my whole body was vibrating, even while the door stood still. 
Then a gunshot, and everything went quiet. I opened the door to see Jeffrey clutching a gun in both hands. X was kneeling on the ground before him, those pale eyes lancing through my body. Now that they were side by side, even the savage snarl further torturing the boy's face couldn't disguise how closely X resembled his father. The boy was already fading into the shadows, vanishing almost immediately except for the white orbs which lingered in accusation. I held my breath, waiting for Jeffrey to take the killing shot. It never came. X was gone. I was still holding my breath when Jeffrey came down the stairs and hugged me, then hugging Prater. I shook so badly that I couldn't even form words, but Jeffrey did the talking for me. I'm so sorry, honey. I never would have let him out if I thought... But the words were all rushing together and I couldn't make sense of them anymore. Especially when he flipped on the light switch and I saw the basement for the first time. The laboratory section was much smaller than I expected. It was just a computer and a locked glass case full of chemicals. The rest of the space looked like you'd expect a boys room to be. There were toys all over the floor and a TV in the corner. There were cartoon posters on the wall, a shelf full of books, and even a nightstand with a framed picture on it. I was in the picture, holding X for the first and last time in the hospital room. Next to it was a stack of drawings, all of me, all so young and beautiful, so much better than I really was. I just don't understand why he would try to hurt you. He talked about you all the time, Jeffrey said. He always wanted to meet you, but I guess he was just too far gone. The syringe. Jeffrey's face grew tighter. Let's all go back upstairs. Prater shouldn't see this. I need to know what was in the syringe. But the look he gave me told me everything I needed to know. X was still trying to help, even after all this time. And the look Prater gave me, I think he understood that too. Now that the secret is out, I don't think he'll ever be able to love me like he used to. Not like X loved me anyway. My husband and I have created a monster and set it loose upon the world, but it isn't X. We are the only monsters here. Eternity is the worst thing about being a ghost. I guess... It's the worst thing about being dead, too. But, I don't suppose you'd really mind. Nothing will ever get better for me. Although, I don't see how it could get worse, either. I'm simply here, seeing but never seen, drifting without destination, waiting for nothing to arrive. Sleep is my only escape. Sometimes I'll spend all day in bed, neither awake nor asleep, alive nor dead, just listening to the whir of the ceiling fan and trying to imagine life as someone else. Ordinary people must wake up so pleased with their desire to accomplish things, fueled by their pride and the knowledge that their actions matter. They must want to better themselves and take care of their loved ones. That must be nice, to feel loved and wanted, or even to have someone notice whether or not I was there at all. The fact is that I'm both prisoner and jailer in my own mind. The obvious solution is to simply unlock my own cell and go into the world. But it's not that easy. Seeing all these purposeful people living their lives without me, it feels like I'm underwater. Only everyone except me can breathe and no one notices that I'm drowning right 
beside them. I did go out today though, simply to exhaust my restless thoughts, and hasten back the temporary death that sleep promised me. I was floating through the park, stealing glances at all the happy people, when something quite miraculous happened. Someone looked at me, not past me, not by me, and not through me. She really saw me. The crease of a smile playing about her lips, her head tracking my movements as I passed. Cool shirt, dude. No angel in heaven has ever sung sweeter words. I was frozen in shock as I watched her go. All it took was a smile, and for a few seconds, I was alive again. She was my only link back to the rest of the world. And if she disappeared now, I might never get another chance. I moved to follow her, but stopped short. What was I supposed to do? Chase her? That seemed preposterous. Should I shout after her? Or would that scare her off? What could I even say? She was in her car now. Another glance in my direction. Another smile. I had no choice but to follow. Stumbling through the shock, breaking into a run as her engine roared into action. A moment later, she was gone, taking my heart with her. Maybe I should have just gone home, but the numbness of my life hadn't returned yet, and I couldn't forget how real her smile made me feel. People don't just go to a park by themselves once, do they? All I'd have to do is wait for her to come back. Faces, people, blurring together and passing by. I waited for her in the park, sun or rain, midnight frost. It couldn't hurt me now. I tried to rehearse a thousand things to say, to make her understand how much her smile had meant to me, but nothing felt right. It didn't matter anyway. Because the moment I saw her again, all words and thoughts were purged from my mind, replaced only by a desperate, unfamiliar hope. It was almost dark, and she was walking fast, but I knew it was her, surely, as I could recognise the moon behind the clouds. Someone was following her, his voice raised and angry. Every once in a while, she'd turn over her shoulder and shout something back. It seemed like a couple's quarrel, although there was a dangerous edge to the man's voice, which unfroze me from my spot. I was catching up with them, and was soon close enough to hear. Ungrateful bitch, where do you think you'd be if I hadn't taken you in? She saw me. Did she see me? I can't tell, but I'd like to think my presence gave her courage. Oh, please. With a pretty face like this, I think I'll be okay. You'll be a whore in a week. Is that what you want? I'm already sleeping with a creep. I may as well get paid for it, right? He didn't see me. He only saw her his vision blind with rage. She glanced past him and saw me. I'm sure of it this time, but her eyes lingered for too long. He was on top of her now, grabbing her arm and dragging her into him. Don't you dare walk away from me. You promised to be mine, and that's what you are, you're- She screamed for help, and at that moment, I wasn't anyone but- Tonight, I was someone. I grabbed the man under his arms and hauled him away from her. He noticed me for the first time, 
flailing wildly and striking me on the jaw with his elbow. Together we tumbled to the ground, me on top of him, pummeling and forcing him down while the girl kicked him hard in the stomach. A moment later, we were running together, leaving him to puke on the ground. Are you okay? I don't know if you remember me, but I remember. Get in the car, she said, quick, before he gets up. I couldn't have concocted a better introduction than that. Living with depression feels like I'm neither dead nor alive. And no, it can't be cured by a passing smile. No matter how breathtaking it is. Just being able to remember that a smile like that exists in this world, though, that's a happy thought. And knowing her life is better, because I'm in it, that's another happy thought. And sometimes, one happy thought can lead to the next and the next, until, without even forcing it, I realise that I'm still alive, after all. And for once, that's a happy thought too. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to the phenomenal Nightmarish Tales, for helping me with the stories in today's video. He is an incredibly talented narrator and a lovely guy. So, please go check out his awesome channel and his repertoire of amazing content for even more stories like the ones you heard tonight. You will be able to find a link on screen now and in the description to see his amazing channel. But anyway, for now guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.